RC Top 3, a weekly podcast of the top three stories from Regnum Christi. The Way of St. Joseph, The Three Fears of St. Joseph, by Father Daniel Brandenburg, L.C. Go to Joseph, Genesis chapter 41, verse 55. Joseph was a just man, and in past posts he taught us from the workshop of his life about the interaction between passions, virtues, and grace that make up a just or good person. All those pieces fit together. They make sense. They provided a lesson to us about how to integrate these three elements in our own lives and get going in the right direction toward the happiness and fulfillment God wants for us. Human life doesn't work when any of those three elements is missing or when they are not integrated harmoniously. St. Joseph also teaches us the importance of the passions, as we discussed last time. Those spontaneous human reactions to stimuli are morally neutral, that is, they are not evil or good in themselves, but that doesn't mean they aren't important. In fact, the passions play a pivotal role in our moral life by facilitating virtue or expediting vice. Like wild horses, they need to be harnessed and directed by reason and virtue and elevated by grace. There is a fascinating parallel between the just patriarch Joseph in the book of Genesis and the just Joseph of the New Testament. Both are just men, favored by God. In each case, their father is Jacob. They are both notable for their dreams, which initially got the patriarch into trouble with his brothers, but later out of jail with Pharaoh. The four dreams of the foster father of Jesus led him to decisive action and safety. In Egypt, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, whose preservation of purity was heroic. In Nazareth and beyond, the beauty and goodness of Mary inspired Joseph to embrace and defend chastity. The patriarch Joseph protected his father and family from famine by bringing them to Egypt, while the new Joseph safeguards Mary and Jesus and eventually takes them out of Egypt. The parallels are part of God's design to prepare for the coming of the Messiah in this world, and Joseph plays a pivotal role in that plan. That is why when Pharaoh says, go to Joseph. We can also take it as an invitation from the Father to learn from this man chosen from among all men to be the foster father of his son. Righteousness, Passions, and Fear The rich traditions of the Church present devotions to St. Joseph highlighting some of his passions, especially his sorrows and joys. Because St. Joseph was human, he certainly experienced the range of all the passions, from love to hate, desire to aversion, joy to sorrow, fear to daring, hope to despair, and anger. Of these eleven, I think the rival passions of fear and daring reveal to us some particularly fascinating things about this man who was the foster father of Jesus and is the patron of the universal church. Why fear? Isn't fear weakness? By recognizing fears in Joseph, are we somehow undermining his holiness or the honor we owe him? But let's not forget that fear is not a sin. It is a passion. It's morally neutral. St. Thomas Aquinas offers a masterful definition of fear. It is the aversion we experience when confronted with some future difficult evil. As we all recall, evil is simply the privation of good or harm to the good we love. Because this perceived evil surpasses our power to evade, control, or vanquish it, we naturally react with trepidation. It spawns indecision, dread, a drive for self-preservation, and can even lead us to backtrack on prior commitments. We are not afraid of things that are distant, nor what we can control or easily overcome. Likewise, we are not afraid of evil that is inevitable or already present. That provokes sorrow. Instead, we fear the future evil that we cannot control. Fear is a reaction. Courage is i.e., the guiding virtue, is a decision. Fear is something every human being experiences at some point in their life. By ignoring or glossing over the fears Joseph faced, we do not honor him, but rather we turn him into an unrelatable caricature, a sort of kitsch and cardboard cutout of a man that we unconsciously recognize as a fake. In contrast, by exploring Joseph's fears, we meet the real man, and learn to appreciate the depth and power of his virtue. The true greatness of a man or woman is not found by ignoring their reality, but in witnessing the triumph of grace and virtue in a human being 
who shares in our own experienced flaws and limitations. This is St. Joseph, a man who experienced fear and overcame it. Courage, i.e. fortitude, is the virtue that harnesses the passions of fear and daring. Courage is knowing what not to fear, and the middle point between fear and overconfidence. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. By probing Joseph's fears, we grasp more deeply both his humanity and his courage. This makes him relatable and opens the possibility for us to be inspired and guided by his example. As long as we gloss over Joseph's passions, we won't really grasp why he is such an extraordinary saint, nor will we get why God chose the silent man who says not one word in Scripture to carry out such an exalted role as the foster father of the Incarnate Word. Relevance of Fear I must confess another motive for exploring the fears of St. Joseph. Modern media and communications deluge us with information, and incitements to fear have increased. For most of human history, knowledge was limited to one's immediate surroundings. As transportation and communication improved, we came to know things from faraway places predecessors could never have known. With the proliferation of personal devices and information glut at our fingertips 24-7, provocations to fear hound us everywhere and at every moment. Not even in the bathroom are we free anymore. The stimuli lead us to worry about the weather or natural disasters in distant lands, foreboding about political decisions at home and abroad, anxiety about ever-expanding dangers to your family and loved ones. In a manner unlike our ancestors ever faced, we live in a world beset by fears. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed just how much fear controls the lives of billions around the globe. For many, the passion of fear has paralyzed them. For others, it has revealed deep insecurities, lack of living faith, and irrational behavior. Some act as if God did not exist or that his promise of eternal life was empty, and this life had to be held on to desperately. Others projected displaced moralism, irrationally asserting responsibility and causality for catastrophe, attempting to control every outcome of health. Such desperate efforts to preserve life have ended up souring the flavor of life. In this context, reflecting on the fears of St. Joseph and how he both channeled and overcame them acquires extraordinary relevance. We need to understand fear and expose it for what it is. Bring it to the light of the world and allow perfect love to cast out all fear. The fears of Joseph navigate into uncharted territory since no systematic exploration of the fears or courage of Joseph exists. I love venturing out into the unknown. In Joseph's workshop, we have much to learn about vanquishing fear. Questions for Reflection 1. St. Joseph was a just man who integrated the passions, virtues, and grace into a harmonious life. In what ways do I recognize him as a model for my own Christian life? 2. If fear is the aversion from a future difficult evil, what fears can I recognize in my life? What are the most significant or recurring fears I experience? 3. Courage, or fortitude, is the virtue that harnesses and guides fear. What are some initial ways I can recognize St. Joseph's courage? How can he inspire me to greater courage? 4. How could exploring the fears of St. Joseph allow me to relate more fully to him? 5. What do I see that St. Joseph can teach me about facing and vanquishing my own fears? Everyday Kind of Love by Celine Dabau in movies, shows, books, and songs, we see love as something that happens to us instead of something that we nurture every day. What we learn from these things is that we can fall in and out of love quickly. But growing up has made me realize that I don't have to look much further than my own home to see what genuine love is. Because after nearly 22 years together, my parents have continued to show us that real love has to be nourished and cherished every day in order for it to flourish. There is a beautiful poem called Every Day by Serge Gabriel that has always reminded me of them. He talks about how when someone asks him what is the most romantic gift you can give another person is, his response is, every day. It is not a glamorous, groundbreaking answer. 
It highlights the hard work and struggles that we will all inevitably face in our relationships. But when two people stick together through both the difficulties and the mundane moments, like my parents continue to do, they will eventually see the fruits of their labor come to life in the lives and vocations of their children. When the pandemic started, everyone had difficulty adjusting to spending all waking hours together. But my parents chose to see this as an opportunity to strengthen their relationship with each other and with God. They spend a lot of time praying with us, having long discussions on what is happening in the church today, and they always make it a point to bond over watching movies together. They find the small moments in their hectic schedules to enjoy each other's presence. There is nothing extravagant about these things, but their love is made all the more meaningful for being built upon the collection of these tiny, lovely moments. The sacrificial love that Christ has for His church, the one that is mirrored by the loving relationships I see in all RC couples, is one that requires a lot of dedication and sacrifice. But Christ leads by example, and He does not shy away from the hard work. Instead, He wholeheartedly embraces it. We are all imperfect, but He envelops us in the greatest and most fulfilling example of sacrificial love ever. It is this magnificent love that I am privileged enough to see in my parents and that I hope to experience one day. I know that I will not let myself or my siblings settle for anything less than this everyday kind of love. Celine Dabau graduated from Everest Academy Manila in 2018 and is currently studying at De La Salle University. She aims to be a high school English teacher after she graduates. Young man, I say to you, arise. She handed me a washcloth. She did it without a word, just this look of concern that said so many things all at once. That glance read, I know. I know what you're thinking, but I don't care. Come help me anyways. It said, Do it for me. Do it for him. There's little time. She wanted help cleaning, but not something simple like a smudge off a window. She wanted me to wash the blood from her son's dead body. Blood out of gashes that I inflicted. On the seventh day of my spiritual exercises last fall, I found myself in this contemplation, a simple reflection on a gospel scene, but one that felt so real. I imagined myself taking Jesus down from the cross and laying his torn, limp body in the arms of his mother. I envisioned the wounds that I myself had carved into his side with my failings and selfish behavior, with my sins. I was sorry, but you can't just hit Control-Z on stripes from scourging. What was done, was done. I knew it. Dead Jesus knew it. And Mary did too. Still, I wiped his side obediently. The cuts and ribs under the cloth felt more like a washboard than a human body. And I guess it was fitting because by his stripes we were made clean. It's Lent as I write this several months later, but that moment keeps coming back to me as we enter into the penitential themes of the penitential season. An essential part of Christian life will always be conversion from our crooked ways and penance for our sins. If we want to grow, then it's crucial to know our failings, to see where we've messed up, and to understand the pain we've caused our Lord. But it can't end there, and it doesn't start there either. I stopped wiping after a time, my hand shaking a bit, wet and cold with Messiah's blood. I looked up at Mary and apologized. I felt I had to. In turn, I apologized to Christ and His Father. I knelt before all of heaven, acknowledging my failure. The angels and saints knew what I'd done. I had hurt their Lord as well as mine. And that's when Jesus jumped the gun. He must have gotten confused. You see, it was day seven of the exercises, a day dedicated to contemplating the passion and death of Christ. The resurrection wasn't supposed to come until day eight. So I was taken by surprise when I felt strong hands grip me from behind, carpenter's hands on my shoulders. And in front of all the hosts of heaven, he leaned in close and whispered in my ear what he said to the widow's son in Nain. Young man, I say to you, arise. Repentance begins and ends with God's love and nothing else. And even in that middle part of the story that looks so dark and ugly, his love is there. Focusing in on failure alone is worse than useless. 
It's frustrating and could even be destructive. Our eyes, even when we feel we're drowning in sin's muck, need to be fixed on the Lord because His love is the one thing that gives context and meaning to our journey toward conversion. It's the light at the end of the tunnel, but also the light at the beginning and middle of it. And when we see our lives in this light, conversion and penance take the form of a free response, not mere duty, frustration, or self-pity. He loves me. He will always love me. So I'll love back and live in His love. That's why Lent is nothing without the resurrection. Conversion is nothing without the unshakable love of God. Penance is nothing without the risen Christ, who is the face of the Father's mercy. So, when you're on your knees again, asking forgiveness for the hundredth time, feel His strong hands steady you. Listen as He speaks His love to your heart and invites you into the eighth day. Because the true experience of repentance only comes when we know we're already in His loving arms. Brother John Sester is a legionary religious, currently studying philosophy at the International College of the Legionaries of Christ in Rome. For more resources, visit www.regnumchristi.org or download the Regnum Christi English app today.